Oh, Jim. Oh, Jim. Okay, oh. you need to you need to get this oh, app. Yeah. It's okay. called Caster. C A S T R. T R. Okay. It's it's how things are done now. Oh, you're sure. You're, you're um, sure. So right. here's the deal. Got it. It's all about lonely spells, underrated. You can find lonely spells find in your area. In your area. Yeah. So look at this. Look at this. Lonely magic mouth seeks good listener. Oh yeah. Right. There you go. Like, I mean, what, that's just exactly what I'm, you're looking I'm, for. I'm swiping right on all that right, right yeah, now. Let's do that. Although I'm do get a lot of like spam for this enlarge reduce uh, thing. That's not, that's not spam. That's not spam. That's something else. You should click on it. See what you think. You know? I mean, I'm I'm good. I don't know. <laughs> These spells, though, I don't know. We should give them a chance. Let's talk underrated spells on WebDM. Okay, Jim, let's talk about some spells and the ratings thereof. Oh, God, yes. First off, who the hell's rating these spells? Who the and how are the hell are they rating them? <laughs> the spell rating just sort of culture in fifth edition mm -hmm. to me it's an it's an inherited uh just sort of thing artifact of of, of D &D -dom, uh that comes out of third edition D D D dumb D and D dumb and man he really D and D dumb he really D and D dumb or it's a D and D dumb which is probably if they're not out there already then they should be yeah uh so if there's a it's this idea that that, that you have like all these spells to choose from yeah. how do you how are you going to make your choice that they're, they're some of them are 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 difficult to parse out like what exactly do they do how mm -hmm. effective are they yeah and so what you would start seeing is like all these guides crop up um you know various online places that usually some color coded system that was like mm -hmm. you know the gold is the best or, or light, the blue light blue or whatever in the yeah. dark blue <laughs> right and, yeah, yeah, yeah and it seems to kind of taken a standard sort of format and and you see it applied to of course not just wizard schools of which like treant monks is uh probably the most well known uh, of the spell guides, and I believe Triant Monk kind of keeps it updated and engages with it, and, and it's not just like a thing that gets dropped and then not updated. It applies that way to class guides and other things. But to me, it like when it comes to spells, I, I find those guides like useful for a sense of like, all right, let me take a look at all the spells and see what someone thinks about them, someone who's like gone over them, analyzed them, looked at them from a certain way. And a good spell guide uh, will, will have like qualifiers and provide context and like, okay, why is it that I'm rating this spell mm -hmm. higher or lower than another? Um, but what I find is like, regardless, two or three telephone receivers down the line, <laughs> you know, by yeah, the, yeah. the time you start playing with people, say at your local game st uh, store or you're just chatting with, uh, you know, with players, uh, you know, in a pickup game or something, that those ratings become not just like someone's opinion or one person's analysis, but become like the way you do this, right? Like this is the spell you take, and if you don't take it, yeah. you, you know, you're a bad player. Oh yeah, kind of only pick gold spells. Right, Why yeah. Why did you pick that black spell, <laughs> you know? Right. And no, what no. I find is that at, from a dungeon master's perspective, it, it creates a lot of samey characters. They all kind of have the same magic, mm -hmm. the same spells, the same things. And wildly different backstories and maybe even different Different yeah. approach to magic. You know, yeah. I'm a sorcerer instead of a wizard this time, but you still took shield. But you still took shield and made <laughs> the same kind of same six, four to six spells that that every uh, you know that everyone picks. And and I you know whether it's a problem or not is largely dependent on the table. But to me, it did, it does result in there being spells that are underused, spells that are underrated. Uh, ones where it's like, yeah, this is like a purple rating, a mediocre rating uh, from one of these spell guides. Or just like the, the culture at large considers this spell to be meh. And what I found is like, that's not always the case. And that attitude, that, that mindset of like, certain spells we're going to take because, you know, they're, they're best in class, kind of. Like Fireball would be an example of this that I pick, or Magic Missile, something like that. Previous editions, Magic Missile, at first level at least, generates you know, some maybe less damage than a dagger strike would, and you can stab someone all day long. You just get one of these magic missiles. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but Jim, I can stab someone <laughs> from way over here. And it automatically hits once. It <laughs> once, yeah. And um, so it comes from situations like that. You know, you don't want to cast that one spell and have it be a dud. You don't want to, uh, you know, have your moment, and, and, you know, you want to be the most effective uh, if, if that's something that you prioritize. For me, though, it just sort of creates a situation where we're all casting the same spells. It's not particularly magical. It starts to look look and feel more like superpowers than, mm -hmm. than like the esoteric workings of, of people who have tapped into the, uh, you know, the, the magic that sustains creation. 
Um, and that's I want that second part out of a D and D experience. If I want yeah. superheroes, I'll play superheroes. You know. Uh, yeah, yeah. I'm the blaster. I have laser eyes. I, you know. Yeah. Yeah, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. From what I'm getting, mm-hmm. it, it it what it really does boil kind of down to is there's this one kind of viewpoint looking at spells. Yes. Like you're you're looking at it. Everybody's supposed to be looking at it through this one facet. Yeah. yeah. Uh, which seems to be combat. Com- how much combat damage does it do? Yeah. How much damage does it prevent? Yeah. And I mean, I I mean, I see it a lot. Yeah, right? you, do, you do see a lot. And especially, you know, in the lead up for this, we were we were asking around, uh, you know, on our various social medias and asking people, you know, what are their what are what spells do they like best? Any spells that they consider like underrated or underused? And reading through those lists was sort of like, yeah, it doesn't surprise me that counterspell and spirit guardians and a whole host of other like um, usual suspects, bless uh, and the like, mm-hmm. end up on those lists because it's those become the spells that you take because, you know, if you're a new player, maybe there's someone in the group who's like, you know, oh yeah, you're playing a warlock, we well, you gotta take Eldritch Blast. Or you're playing a hunter, you gotta, gotta take, take Hunter's, you know, Hunter's Mark. Mark. Yeah. <laughs> or sorry, not Hunter, Ranger. Uh, you know, and it that's how these things perpetuate. I've seen it happen myself where someone tries to cast a spell that's maybe not that great, like Witch Bolt or something. You know, someone goes, oh, well, you know, it, 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 you know, it doesn't work or that spell sucks or, you know, they start quoting something they read online somewhere and it snowballs and no one stops and goes like, yeah, well, I, I just want to cast this spell anyway. Like, it, it doesn't matter what someone online says. And I know for there are some players where if they cast a spell that doesn't do what they want, they might get uh, frustrated or, or upset or something. But I also know that from a DM's perspective, a lot of times that frustration seems to manifest because it's like, yeah, you can't just cast a charm person and have it automatically work and have a thrall for the next day. You know, like a lot of that frustration, at least as I've experienced it from, from being a DM, is is that players want magic that's like overwhelmingly powerful and effective and like I cast this spell and, and there's no chance to resist or you know how many times I've had to <laughs> sit through a string of like well that's such BS you know whenever as a dungeon master I've made my save and it's like well it's kind of the way the game rules go like if it was yeah. automatic then it eventually would get boring <laughs> you know <laughs> yeah, yeah I mean after a while you would get tired of just saying oh I cast this because I know it'll work because I know time. it'll work every time yeah 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 we, we play these games for the chance of failure you got to ride the lightning you yes. got to go right on the edge you know and push the envelope and all that and yeah. come out on top hopefully yeah and it's the unexpected uh and and you know the uh, both the unexpected and happening and players making unexpected decisions that mm-hmm. I like best about it and so when I see players making these same decisions over and over again and in this case choosing which spells they select for the day or the, that they select as their spells known uh, it just sort of leads me to go like well what what's going on here that it seems like there are a handful of spells out of all of the potential ones you could choose that seem to get uh, chosen more often than not and mm-hmm. from a player's perspective it's tough to choose underrated spells like it's tough to be say the only wizard in a party and forego the big wizard spells, counterspell, fireball, uh, you know, uh, some of the better, better ones of, um, you know, second level, like mirror image oh, or yeah, invisibility definitely. or misty step. It's like, it's difficult to not take those. Like you, in mm-hmm. some sense, you might actually be making the challenge of overcoming, you know, certain encounters more difficult for your party by not having them. Mm-hmm. But I don't know that that's enough reason to like put pressure on people, players who are, who are choosing their spells. You know, I, I still think it should be something that you pick the spell because you want to use it. It's fun. It, it fulfills some role or, or has some purpose that you want to, to use it for. And like, yeah, it might not be the best. Mm-hmm. But what does that even mean? Like, you know, it's, it's such, such a sh- subjective uh, thing. I don't know. I just find the the whole attitude surrounding like, take this spell or that, or is this spell broken, or or does this spell is it worth casting to be? Uh, I don't know. A lot of unspoken priorities. A lot of unspoken uh, assumptions. A lot of times with some spells, like you see people online talk about a certain spell in a way, and then you go read it, and it's like, but yeah. it doesn't really say that. So like, how does that? How, how do you think about that when it comes to the spells, how they're written versus how they're actually used? Yeah, so that's, I mean, that's another big one, right? Like, we, we do these shows where we're going over a lot of spells, and so we sort of, like, try to figure out how are the spells being used in actual play. An example of this would be something like Grease. Yeah. We, we saw a ton of people saying, like, Grease is one of my favorite ones. It's underrated. Nobody ever hardly takes it. And then examples of people using it, and it's like, I'm putting it on pe- enemies' weapons. I'm putting it on the rope. I'm doing this and that. And yeah. it's like, the spell clearly says it covers a, 10 
you know, a 10 foot square area of ground, not the table, not a weapon, not a person or creature, it's a ground. And like maybe after the fact, you can scoop up some of that grease and throw it and on throw them. it. <laughs> and I'm not sure that like in, in the situation where I'm, you know, I'm that DM, I might say, yeah, sure. That sounds like an interesting use of the spell. And that sounds like an effect that would fit for a first level spell, but it, raises the point that the spells are written in a certain way and they're written with you know sometimes precise language sometimes not they're all subtly different you know some mm -hmm. spells that negatively affect you you get a save at the end of your turn sometimes that's automatic sometimes you have to do something to prompt that save yeah uh you know maybe you don't get a save maybe it just works and you have to endure the duration or Maybe it's a spell that the caster doesn't need to concentrate on, so you can't like go after them to try to end the spell if you can't make your save. Something. Yeah, yeah. So it's there's so much variation in the spells. There's so much variation in what they're used for and in how they get used at the table. That again, sort of like thinking like best spell or 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 you know the, the you know highest rated is just weird to me. What do you think about that? Like the spells are written a certain way, but then the way they get played is different. It just seems like well, he, here, everybody does it, you know? Yeah, no, no, Here and here's my thing. I think this is where we, we've talked about this before, yeah. how these spells are the most well-known in this world. Oh, sure. Right? These are the, like, oh, they're taught at every university because it's just kind of baseline knowledge. Yeah. I think this is where I don't necessarily have a problem with it, but I would encourage that player to be like, okay, so you want to use a off-book use for that spell, so let's talk about spell research yes. and start talking about ways to make it your spell as yeah. opposed to the baseline spell. Yeah. Then you can change up what the, the, the components and like what level it is or what it does mm -hmm. uh, because I, I was actually going to throw back to you on, on <laughs> another use of grease and I know it was an older one and I think it's more of a, an artifact of the world we live in and the fact that grease is flammable here because it's a patrol, most of them are kind of a origin oh, sure, from yeah, like yeah. a petroleum based an product animal so, product or yeah an, animal by product, product. That, yeah, sure. but like in this it's a magical grease so like is it just flammable automatically because you hear grease and you think grease fire and sure. so i can set it on fire yeah. like i mean that's something i think like i i work those kind of things out um as part of just the cosmology of a world so like i know where that grease comes from in my yeah. world you're probably chances are you're probably summoning something up from miles down below and it's it's a it's going to seep up through the ground mm -hmm. which is why you know, it needs to be touching the ground and it's a viscous slippery oily kind of substance yeah. um now if you go to find that or to mine it in the, in the real you know not the real world but in the campaign world and you say you're going to go prospecting for oil deposits <laughs> Uh, then you'd need to work, watch out for a lot of things. I, I, that to me, um, petroleum and fossil fuels are black oozes. Like that's in my world, that's just how they are because it's sort. Of, I, when I look at it, I'm just like, yeah, that's that. It's it's decomposed organic matter that's been sitting under intense pressure for millions of years. Mm -hmm. That sounds like necromancy to me. And well, <laughs> now you're not only sort of like, yeah. becomes a black ooze. Yeah, not <laughs> only uh, intense pressure, intense <laughs> magical pressure, intense magical pressure. So yeah, yeah. I, I, I'd like to think that the phonic energy. Yeah, there. that as it as it. As it uh, deteriorates, they just like that that leftover essence just gets recombined yeah, yeah, yeah. and comes back. <laughs> yeah, it's it's not like it brings it back from the dead, but it's not it's not it's not dead. It's not dead. Yeah, there's something <laughs> it moves there. around. Yeah, something animates. It. And, and yeah, so now you're now we're talking about how uh, the skin of evil that episode <laughs> next year. I would let it probably be set on fire. You know, I I think that it would be Fracomancer. Sorry. Yes, <laughs> something like that. I but I like working through those things, right? I like I, yeah. I like working through the implications of spells. It's why like some underrated spells I kind of look at like Grease, mm -hmm. and I say like I really like this spell. I might take it as, you know as often as possible, uh, just because I I find that it's um, you know good for a lot of things, and specifically for Grease, like it prompts a Dex check and it's no concentration and you know it's not something that. Um, you know, is likely to be turned away by a legendary resistance or something like that. You might mm -hmm. can get something with a nice uh, yeah, slip on a grease patch. <laughs> slips under the radar a little bit, so to speak. Right. Yeah. Um, but in, uh, other considerations, I think, in terms of spells, uh, spells in play uh, versus spells as written, are things like consider all of the illusions. Yeah. Right. Consider how vague some of them are. Consider how there's not a lot of uh, like mechanical tools for adjudicating when does a creature suspect 
that an illusion is an illusion. How exactly do they disbelieve? A lot of that's hand waved away and is just abstracted into the wisdom save. Mm -hmm. But I think there's just a, a lot of gray area in terms of illusions, particularly when it comes to like really creative players who want to do complex things with their illusions. Yeah. Um, so dependent on the DM, so dependent on the campaign. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I think the illusion school is one of the most that is uh, prone to, uh, to be metagamed. Sure. Because yeah. as you're describing, I cast this thing, whether it's the DM or the player, yeah. the other person knows that you're casting something that isn't real. Yes. Right? Yeah. Unless you have a have an understanding, which I think is a good idea, have an understanding where when you say you cast a spell, you're casting the intended the intended uh, perception. Right. Right? And yeah. so you would have to talk about that with your DM or your play, you know, fight DM to player yeah. and work that out ahead of time. Uh, and it might confuse the players at the table at first, um, but I don't know. I think that's that's one way because I think it's just that that's what's sad about illusions. It's just like that's one of the mechanics where it's just kind of like, well, okay, I failed my save. I know it's fake, but mm, yeah, I know. failed my save. I know it's fake. I'm gonna go up and touch it anyway, and it's like, but your player wouldn't do that because you failed your save, so he thinks it's real. Yeah, and yeah. so I, I don't know. There are anything that relies on the player playing a flaw or mm -hmm. playing something that rely that that really requires them to separate out. I mean this is why some DMs roll perception te tests and behind the saves yeah. behind the screen because they're like I don't want the outcome of this influencing my players oh, uh, yeah. actions. And cool. and that's one of the instances where I might roll behind a screen or in secret or I might just roll five dice in front of you and not tell you which one I'm looking at. You know, that's another, that's how I do that in the open. <laughs> um, or just roll five dice and it wasn't really for anything. You just want to keep the players on their toes. You can do, yeah, there's some, <laughs> some of the theatrics, the, the um, what do you call it, the showmanship of being a DM involves a little bit of that. An open rolling. <laughs> <laughs> just ominously rolling my D30 in front of everybody. So illusions. They are difficult to for the DM to sort of figure out how they impact, especially if you haven't built tools for yourself, like here's how my NPCs react to certain things. Mm -hmm. And this is why we talk so much about building game structures and tools is because if you just like rely on whatever's on the top of your head at the moment, that's how you get stuck in ruts. That's how you, your unconscious bias seeps in. Mm -hmm. You could be one of those DMs who just like doesn't care for, has a personal bias against certain spells just because you're like, I don't like it. It's not my favorite. And so when it's used, you might yeah. judge a little bit harsher. Uh, you could have like contradictory that. judgments. Because, contradictory because judgments, yeah. going off the top of your head and you feel like you're having a good day versus a bad day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You forgot what you said last week or there's an argument because someone read something online about how the spell should work and now oh, there's yeah. this. So there's just a lot of things like that that contribute towards why some spells are seen as... Um, you know, not worth preparing and casting. Because it's like, yeah, if you had to do endure that every time you tried to cast a, a spell or certain, certain kind of magic, uh, then you might not, you know, you might just be like, yeah, it's not worth it. I'm just going to do the one that just, yeah, it does what it says on the tin. Yeah, fuck it. I'm just going to cast fireball. <laughs> cast a fireball. <laughs> yeah, you know, you were trying over here to set up a, elaborate major images and, and do all these fun things. And like, okay, I'm going to, it's an illusion of us walking 30 feet ahead of us in the dungeon. So we'll trip off any ambushes before then. And the DM never, you know, responds to your actions there. I don't know. We, I to talk wild for about illusions, but illusions are, are really highlight that difference between how this is written and how it actually gets played. Durations are another. Oh, yeah. Like yeah, how, so how we think about this? How do you track the durations of your spells, whether you're a player, whether you're a player or like a, a DM? Uh, I mean, I always do tick marks. Tick marks, yeah. Like I, when I cast a spell, I write the either if it's just you know like hex or whatever, I uh -huh. write hex with a line, and then you know I cast it, psh, tick. That's yeah. one one round. Once mm -hmm. we're done, and mm -hmm. we, when we come back around, tick tick. And that's it, you know, and I, yeah. and I, you know, I always like try to throw in, if it's concentration, put a C and circle it, you mm -hmm, know, whatever. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I mean, I am pretty OCD about that, actually. Sure, yeah, um, sure. Especially if I'm playing a caster, you know, and I have multiple spells up, especially clerics, I think, is oh, probably yeah. that one of the better examples. Sure. Where you can have multiple things up that last a long time. First off, the tick is, is fine, and, you know, you can, it's one of those things where if you're a player, you know, checking in with the DM, hey, has it been 10 minutes, has it been one minute, that kind of thing. But I think just keeping track of your own spell durations, even just noting them uh, is, is something that players should do. Uh, I usually have, if, if I'm in, playing a game in which the time, like the time of spells is, is important, right? Like, it, you know, we have an hour to accomplish something while this spell is active. Then I'll do something similar to a tick, uh, tick marks. Usually I'll have like, a, it's like a, a circle divided into six 
slices and you sort of like fill in the pie pieces until you get oh, yeah. to every, the hour. Every 10 minutes. Every yeah, 10 yeah. minutes. Oh, totally. Um, but mine's all based on like basic D&D's dungeon crawling procedure, so it's broken down into 10 minutes. And I find that really helpful because I, I it begin, you know, whenever they're exploring a location, moving around the city, something like that, I just tend to think of the game as being in 10 minute chunks. Mm -hmm. We're gonna we're gonna do this thing and then maybe we've hit fast forward and move, you know, 24 hours later or something like that. But oh yeah. But the other way you can you know, can sort of address that if durations of spells is, is getting to be a problem it's sort of, you know, it's it's like, well, how long does say pass without trace last? And how long we've we been trudging around this swamp trying to avoid the patrols. And if you're just hand waving a lot of that and it doesn't matter to you, then it doesn't matter to you and you're probably playing and it's totally fine. But if, say, you've got players where they want the precision of, like, no, my spell lasts an hour, or this is what it does, uh, then if they have experiences at the table where, you know, the spell isn't, isn't run that way, and it's run in a way that makes it less effective, mm -hmm. then they might say, well, no, this spell's bad, and, and right. you know, I don't oh, really no. cast it. You know, anyway. Oh, no, I, to I totally get that, because if, if there's an aspect of, a, of, of anything in the game, uh, that is important to you, and it is just completely ignored or discounted. Yeah. I mean, even in the even in the interest of just like, oh, we're just streamlining the the process, you know. Yeah. But oh, no, I mean, this is important, and and anything certainly. that's important to a player should be important to a DM. Certainly, certainly, and and you know, when when we think of like spells that are underrated and spells like, why does they not get chosen? Why does why or why is it that combat seems to favor? Uh, you know, so many spells seem to be from the combat category. They're offensive magic, or or really help you out in a fight. And I think that's because the, the real answer for why some of these spells are underrated is that not enough DMs create situations in which these spells will be useful. Mm -hmm. And so, if you think of something like Calm Emotions, Calm Emotions is a spell that's sort of like easy to overlook. Why would you take it? Just on the surface of it, it's like why? Why would I want to calm anyone down? Like, yeah, like we, <laughs> I want to ramp things up. We're yeah, here we to kick <laughs> down the door, and then we draw our sword, <laughs> and then you cast Calm Emotions. Yeah, yeah. I but got my sword out. <laughs> I've got my sword out. Sure, but then you've never been in a situation where you don't want to have a fight right now, and a minute of an enemy regarding you as indifferent could be a lifesaver. Yeah. Or, right? or you've never been in a situation in which one of the party members or an in allied NPC has been charmed or frightened and you need them to snap out of it right now. Not just one of them, but a 20 by 20 block of them mm -hmm. at range. You know, yeah. like once you start thinking about those things, uh, you know, you can see like, all right, you know, illusory script is a very good spell if secrets and the passing of information between individuals is a priority in your game. Same with like Magic Mouth. Oh yeah, Magic Mouth's it, a great one. You know, Fireball will be utterly useless in a game of court intrigue and, and sort of uh, social backstabbing. You know, as you continue to play the game and you find yourself in different situations and your DM sets up different situations for you, like experimenting and just go like, all right, this time I'm gonna take this spell I've never picked before. I don't know, that's a real, fun way to play the game and a way to learn like all the ins and outs and to know when you will be in situations where those underrated spells are mm -hmm. gonna be really worthwhile well i mean but I, that, that's kind of the rub though right yeah. is is some people are like well i don't know what i need to be prepared for and it's like yes. well yeah but that's life sure yeah i yeah. mean it's it's you you have a you have a few experiences and then you start to learn how you can use these spells to your advantage. Yes. And that way you're better, you're more comfortable, but it's okay to just go ahead and take them and try it out, right? It, it is, certainly, yeah. And so you have cantrips. If you need some damage, you probably have a cantrip that does oh, sure. damage, yeah, right? yeah, 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 certainly. And, you know, a lot of it comes down to play style. You mm -hmm. know, if you are playing in a game where there's maybe one or two fights every other session or so, it's not a lot of, com it's not real combat heavy, then you might just stick with some old reliables, you know? And, you know, we know that we're not placing a huge emphasis on fights and, you know, the Scorching Ray and Shield and all those, just the basic ones are, are going to get me through. But if if you're not, if, if you're engaged in sort of the central premise of whatever game it is, then I think like experimenting with the spells and figuring out what situations they're useful in, then you can start anticipating, um, mm -hmm. you know, when they will be useful. The other thing is to create the situations yourself in yeah. which they will be useful. And this is part of that PCs pursuing their own goals. Not every DM uh, in, enjoys that play style, but one way that you can highlight and feature spells and abilities that don't normally get a lot of love in your game is to just say, I want to do this thing where X thing has a situation that, uh, you know, this magic would be useful. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that, like, taking the game in a direction, like, not permanently, but, you know, we steer over here for a little bit, come back, as it relates to your character and maybe some others that you've roped into it, it's a very powerful and engaging way to play the game. You know, it's... 
doing what you want and and pursuing your own goals as a character as opposed to like whatever the main quest is you find yourself with all kinds of varied situations and and scenarios and that is where a lot of these spells will shine mm -hmm. because they're not combat in a you know largely featureless room in you know places where big damage or or big effects uh, have the most impact would you uh, give me some examples of some of your favorites of the uh, of the overlooked or overrated or excuse me underrated underrated yeah um, I, mean, I mean we, we can talk about we some can talk overrated. about overrated we'll talk, we can talk about some overrated spells <laughs> here in a minute yeah <laughs> let's give these they're doing then we'll shit on those later yeah, yeah. so uh, some some of my underrated favorites uh, yeah. we've we've talked about some of them. Greece uh, is is on there um, as is uh, calm emotions mm -hmm. uh, both of those calm emotions sort of fits in a category with like modify memory and enthrall mm -hmm. as really cool enchantment style and sort of mind magic effects that don't see the love of, of suggestion or, or some of the other, you know. Well, I mean, to me, it's like, it's all, most everybody, it's like, oh, they'll take suggestion, but the other ones are like, eh. uh, Yeah, and you I know. think like, I mean, enchantment probably, did take a hit in fifth edition. Yeah, but... they, it did. And I, I think that's probably accounts for some of it with, with the way friends and charm person work, that, that suggestion is kind of the first big yeah. enchantment spell that doesn't have a real drawback yeah. uh, from it. Although Charm Person doesn't have a duration either. So come on, guys. Or not duration, but concentration. It's, it's got a duration, but you yeah. don't have to concentrate on it. But, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I think it's that detriment part that people don't like, but I yeah. mean, really, you did just use magic to make someone your friend. Yeah, well, so. I, now, <laughs> I mean, friends is one of those where I look at it and I go, shouldn't this, uh, this affects my character only. Why does the why does the NPC give a shit what I do to my character? Like charm person, I get, but friends, I don't see. Anyway, yeah. that's again another. Uh, we can keep beating that uh, that dead horse. Um, so <laughs> Stay down. <laughs> in terms of uh, uh, first level spells, I really enjoy Armor of Agathus. Yeah. Uh, in terms of like def defense uh, in, in the form of temp HP, proactive defense, uh, and then the retroactive or not re reactive. Uh, damage from it. It's just a great, fun spell for a melee-focused uh, warlock. Yeah, I mean, they say uh, the best offense is a good defense, but I say the best offense is a defense that is also offense. Oh, nice! And that's what that is. But it's also yeah. like a great. Uh, it's also like a great uh, pickup for like a magic initiate for your fighter or something mm -hmm. like oh, that. Oh, you know what God, I mean? Yes. It's, uh, yeah, you don't need it to last forever. Right. Here's another one. Put give it to your barbarian because it doesn't require concentration. They cast it before they rage. And now they've rage. got now they've got their uh, you know it's a, it's good for especially I guess like a storm barbarian because it kind of like fits with the same theme and it just oh, anyway yeah. I like it uh, of course obviously a lot of people mentioned it but in terms of just like number of mentions it got um, you know armor bag this I get some love Tasha's hideous laughter would be another one it's funny like I just like I'm just gonna make someone laugh so hard they fall down they, 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 they might completely drop something they might drop something they might uh, you know do something rash or foolish because they're laughing I like it because I like Tasha who is the uh, uh, sort of the alter ego of Iglewilf, who the author of, uh, of the Demonomicon and so I like that that this little tidbit of lore sneaks into uh, D&D where it's just sort of like I know who Tasha is and I know that 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 they are not a nice person. So why is it that we're casting her spell to <laughs> make people laugh? <laughs> well, she got one over on all of us. Right. And the jokes on us. It was on that. <laughs> um, and then some others are uh, Phantasmal Force, which mm -hmm. is a just a, a cool spell for uh, you know players who want to get creative. Uh, it's also like one of the few ways you can deal actual damage, illusion. you know, through an illusion. Although I change it so that you know when you increase the level. Uh, of, of the spell, use a different slot to cast it, it also increases the damage that it does um, to that, as well as just sort of situational modifiers dep depending on um, things that you do to make the situation worse for the target of the phantasmal force. So like if you accompany the phantasmal force and you've got maybe like somehow some ability to read their mind so you know what they're seeing, then then you can maybe summon other things to enhance that kind of uh, the fear that comes from that. The bottom line for a lot of these spells when how I run them is just a the willingness to alter their effects on the fly mm -hmm. if what the players are doing if it makes sense uh, 
for that spell to be altered. And I got no problem altering a spell. As people, as viewers of the uh, of our channel know, with regards to Moonbeam, uh, which <laughs> I had altered so long ago that I completely forgot that I had altered it. Uh, and so it was actually like after the after our favorite spells, we were talking about Moonbeam on it, and a lot of people were like, "Wait a minute, no, it doesn't." And I was like, the, my, "At the first few times, I was like, ah, no, they're not. I know it works." And then I was like, "Wait a minute, everybody's saying it doesn't immediately do damage when you manifest it in an area," which I disagree with, obviously. And then go and read in Sage Advice, and I'm like, geez, the explanation for Moonbeam is like three times as long as the spell. Like, I don't know. I, I run it the way that I talked about in that one. It deals damage as soon as, it, as soon as it shows up and again on their first turn. And I've done it for four years, and it has not broken anything. We're all still here. Yep. Fine. But I was wrong. That's fine. I'll take that one. Um, <laughs> but it I'm highlights. Wrong, but I'm not changing. It highlights how interpretation of a spell and and house rules and how you play and and yeah. like there's so many ways in which house rules become so ingrained in you that you forget that it's not the way the game's played. Mm -hmm. uh, so we're rounding out some of the lower level ones are my favorites. Zephyr Strike uh, for hunters, mostly because I have an irrational and, uh, and and very intense reaction to hex and hunter's mark. Uh, I think there should be class abilities if they're going to be used that much and uh, not precious spell picks. <laughs> and, yeah. and so like anything where it's like I have to take this spell because it ties together a class or something like that, but I have to use one of my limited picks for it is probably going to get me going, nope. And so my current ranger, I'm not going to take Hunter's Mark with them. I'm probably not going to take Pass Without Trace. And um, I instead chose Zephyr Strike because to me it like, it plays into the melee ranger uh, sort of build. It's really cool if you can pick it up uh, through, um, you know, through some other means for a melee focused character. And it's just, uh, I don't know, I really like it. Well, I mean, it does cover two of the three aspects of, uh, of spell classification, kind of. I mean, it, it gives you a little speed boost and a little damage boost. You so. get a little, yeah, you get a little damage boost uh, and a little speed boost when you do damage. It, the the ability to just kind of like walk around the the battlefield. That's by, of course, with uh, with rangers by second level. Uh, without having to worry about attacks of opportunity is, mm -hmm. is really cool because you're probably doing that before most other characters can and um, it highlights that skirmish role uh, oh, yeah. of the ranger. I just like a lot of things about it. Mm -hmm. uh, in terms of higher level spells that don't see a lot of love but are also really cool for um, you know just DMs to use in a campaign, uh, the, these would be Dream, Magic Jar, and Imprisonment. Dream is a great just... I want to give some information to the players. And prophetic dreams, disturbing dreams, oh, yeah. dream omens, they're just a staple of fantasy. And this spell is there to like, let's have it. Oh, oh, totally. I, I use it uh, quite extensively in Star Rebound. Um, you know, we talked about this mm -hmm. the podcast before, but I took away the damaging aspect of it. And, mm. and I, I forego the, the taking the good night's sleep away. Sure, uh, sure. Because sure. I wanted to spam it. I wanted to just mess with the player, mm -hmm. right? And so there was no consequence to it, but they were still trying to figure out, like, what was going on. Right. Um, and uh, it, it's it's great for that. Yeah, because um, you can send cryptic dreams, and it's just, like, a pleasant dream yeah. or a dream of this thing. And, and the nightmare component of dream, I find, pairs really well with Gesh. Like, when you start looking at Gesh and you're like, oh, that's paltry damage per day... But then you go like, yeah, but what if I was denying you long rests? Mm -hmm. the, and the two, those two things are, uh, those two spells in, in conjunction can really mess with a, uh, a player's day or a group's day. Um, Magic Jar is just a cool villain spell just to be able to switch minds with people. It, it's reminiscent of that Lovecraft story, the thing on the doorstep. Uh, just like the horror of having your mind swapped and, and, and finding yourself in an unfamiliar uh, body while the villain does whatever they want with yours. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's a complicated spell, so it, it, it's kind of like requires some, like, okay, how does this work? How does that work? But it's just fun. Yeah. And you can also use it as a player for a lot of, like, really creepy, weird, and uh, sometimes funny uh, <laughs> shenanigans. So high shenanigan potential. Mm -hmm. um, imprisonment, ninth level spell takes the target, puts them in a capsule underneath the earth, buries them there. Yeah. And I include this spell because of a line in first edition. And the line in first edition is um, whenever you cast the reverse of this spell to free a person uh, thus imprisoned, there's a 10% chance that one to 100 other creatures will reappear with your target 
because number one, that's how thick the Earth's <laughs> mantle is with incised, <laughs> you know, people who pissed off archmages. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> we wonder where volcanoes and, hurt and earthquakes come from. Right, and like because the you know you you yourself aren't being that precise. It's just sort of like. How many of these people are there down there? Yeah. And I, I like I said, I, I picked it because, um, you know, ninth level spell, most ninth level spells are underrated because they hardly ever get cast. Uh, but I, I, it's, a, it's the way to highlight the fact that um, these spells exist in the world. They're, they, they exist to, like, in the case of imprisonment, for petty mages to just, like, you know, feud with each other and, uh, you know, in, a tr in true Vancey in fashion. Lock each other up for a century. <laughs> right. <laughs> I was thinking, so actually, this is a weird tangent, but I'll go ahead and just spit it out. Like, there is a there is a Vance spell that I want to see in D&D, &D, and it's the charm of the macroid toe, and it's you cast it, and on, um, you know, you're, you're the target of your spell, one of their big toes become the size of a house. And it immobilizes them, you know, but pain, very painful. And it's basically a spell that existed because one mage just wanted to mess with and make life miserable for another mage in the dying world of, of Jack Vance. And I just, it's, it's great. And I, you know, it's underrated. It's so underrated they haven't even written it up yet in D and D. So I'm just wondering, like, would you immediately black out because all the blood in your body would <clears throat> fill that giant toe and like you were literally. Sort of insanguinated. Insang yeah, you could be exsanguinated, but, but, but yeah, it's still in there. Or do you, there. as the blood supply, uh, uh, I mean, proportionally it increased? It doesn't kill them. Yeah, I, mean, I, you, I would think it does. I would think, uh, the but you at least increased. like kind of get lightheaded. I would think as the rush of blood. Oh sure, um, yeah, yeah, the rebalancing of. But that would, uh, man, no, F that <laughs> curse of the macro. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that, that would be nuts. <laughs> and finally, the most underappreciated, underrated uh, spell: the goat. Oh, yeah. Mold Earth. Mm -hmm. At this point, I feel like we should just tell you guys to go watch Ziba Shu's video on it. The animated spell book of Mold Earth has everything you would need to know about why we love it. Yeah. We, yeah. Um, but yeah, Mold Earth is, is a, just, it's just a fun spell. Anything that lets you manipulate the game world from like a physical perspective and it's permanent. Mm -hmm. You know, just like, I'm moving this dirt. And, and from there, the extrapolation of just like one thing, I can move five, a cubic, five cubic feet of earth from here to there. Well, okay, well I can do that in six seconds. How much can I do in a minute, in a day? And whatever, how can I set up these things? It's like it turns your D&D &D game into Minecraft. Mm -hmm. yeah, you're, making a <laughs> you're making a swimming pool every minute. Right, right? it's just like, yeah, it's just so they, a, a fun spell to me because it has a permanent impact on the game. It doesn't, you know, disappear whenever you stop thinking about it. it mm -hmm. Magic in fifth edition is so ephemeral. It's so, uh, you know, it, its impact on the world is, is limited to like killing things for the most part. Not, I mean, that's a big blanket statement, but Mold Earth is different. Mold Earth is like a peasant came up with this spell. You know, it's like somebody, you know, like, you know, like this is you a. Mean the people on the ground that actually right, need the magic need instead of the magic. fucking managers right. that just keep giving us <laughs> shitty spells. Yeah, no, I get it. I get yeah, because so the manager would be like, no, a shovel is way cheaper than researching a spell and teaching it to you guys. Like, pick, get a pickaxe, get a shovel. You don't need any of that. And somebody's just like, no, I'm never going to dig a ditch again in my life. Well, the problem now, I mean, see, now you put it that way, Jim, and I can see, you know, then who, who pay, like the guy who chopped down the tree to make the handle of the axe or yeah, the shovel, yeah, yeah. the guy who made the shovel head. Yeah. You're taking all this out of the economy. I mean, yeah. your, your, your medieval world economy is going to crash. I mean, the medieval world economy is <laughs> already crashed because we're dealing with, like, you know, the, the truckloads of 100 gold piece pearls and the... Uh, you the, know, boom the, and bust <laughs> the boom and bust economy. Of, 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 of the boom and bust economy. the adventuring trails. the adventuring trails. The... All of that, you know, the yeah, yeah. The, the, <laughs> the fact that Leoman's tiny hut is wrecking the service economy. <laughs> Inns are shutting from here to Cormier. Right. Because everybody can just cast tiny Everybody hut. can just test their tiny hut and their unseen servants. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I think those are mine. Any, any that we didn't talk about that like you find uh, um, well, I, underrated? I've got a couple. Uh, yeah. A big one in, in Starward Bound was see invisibility. Yeah. They were getting scried on left and right. Uh -huh. They had a couple of interactions with invisible creatures that they mm. never knew were happening. Yeah, and I, you know, it's one of those things where maybe it was a failing on my part for not dropping enough hints that like the enemies know what you are going to do before you do sure. it. How could they know that? Right, right. right. 
Uh, but it's it's one of those things where it's like one of the players could easily cast this almost every day. Right, yeah. You know, but they never do. And they have a big do. meeting. All right, what are we going to do about this bad guy? Let's have a meeting. Camera over the shoulder. Yeah. Bad guy going, like, oh, oh. yeah, what's going on? Oh, they're going to come in the south entrance. Cool. Yeah. Reinforce the south entrance, please. <laughs> um, and, and, and then the other one I would think is, and it, this one gets kind of crapped on because it's not nearly as cool as it was in third and 3.5, mm. but enhance ability. Oh, it's yeah, still, definitely. Like, for a spell, when you have it, it can affect any of your abilities. Mm-hmm. Like, when you want to think about thinking ahead, like, yeah. you don't really have to. Just have the spell on hand. Yeah. Oh, you need to sneak past that guy. You want to sneak past that guy? Here, let me give you this advantage yeah. on stealth checks. Oh, you want to... Can you, oh, Bard, you want to try to trick that guard? Here, have this charisma. You, yeah. and, you know, like, I don't know. It's yeah. just... It's one of those You're things about where you're getting just... a counter counter spell battle with oh, another God. caster. Then give me a boost to my mm-hmm. <laughs> my casting stat. Hell while yeah, I have to, uh, counter spell. Uh, yeah. yeah, I mean it's not nearly. Yeah. It doesn't give you the the old school. You know, one d four plus. Oh one, yeah, yeah. Which yeah. is that's the thing that everybody just misses. I want that. Sure, yeah. It's not like raising your stats. Yeah, but you but know. still, like in a way, it kind of is because you get advantage, so you have a better right. chance of rolling better. And so I don't know. It, that's one of those, and we've already talked about Magic Mouth, but I just, I don't know. <laughs> I really, yeah, I Magic Mouth's a fun When spell. I think about Magic Mouth, <laughs> what I think about is what I love is you can stipulate who can actually hear it. Yeah. And then I think about that moment in the movie Serenity where Mr. Universe leaves that message to Mel. Oh, yeah, yeah. With yeah. his robot. Yeah. With his love bot. Yes, with And robot. he basically cast the sci-fi version of Magic Mouth. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but he didn't stipulate who could listen to it. Mm. And that's why, you know, the bad guy got to hear it. The bad guy got to hear it. Good. You gotta... You gotta Friends from foes. I'm just saying. But, it's uh, too bad. It's yeah. really too bad. Too bad. <laughs> should have cast Augury so he knew. He should have. <laughs> right. He should have known. <laughs> Wheel or woe? Woe, dude. Woe. Whoa. <laughs> whoa. Uh, yes. Underrated spells. They're, I, you know, try one out. If you've never cast a spell before, try it. Find a, find a scenario in which it would be... Uh, yeah. You have a you have a, you have a thing. I want to what talk about this right quick. Right, you have a thing that you've talked about uh, with spells. Oh. And that might kind of at least banish this a little bit, oh. which is which is the idea that like your first level caster, whether you're a sorcerer or a wizard, like why are oh, you? Yeah. I, I know players are just gonna be like, oh, yeah, yeah. They're, but they're why are you like picking your spells? Why, why if are you're you getting allowed this to random pick your magic? Spells? Why are you allowed to pick your initial spells? Yeah, why are you allowed to pick? Yeah, and I'm thinking specifically of the three arcane uh, type casters in fifth edition, like warlocks. Why are you allowed to pick your magic? Why isn't your patron picking your magic? Mm-hmm. Sorcerers. Why are you allowed to pick your magic? Why isn't your bloodline manifesting? Like, it, and maybe it might be like, yeah, well, this bloodline or ancestry for these sorcerers, we only ever know these fifteen spells. Mm-hmm. Like these are the only ones we ever know and that's just it you know yeah, kind uh, of like the witcher you have these five things yeah. you can do mm-hmm. and you can you can manipulate those you can manipulate things. them you can change them you can kind of do whatever yeah wizards it's like why are you picking your own spells didn't your master like did you make that spell book yourself you really you you researched and and did all of those spells yourself as a first level wizard i don't mm-hmm. think so no, you like, probably found a spell book you found a spell book where your master gave you one yeah, or, or, yeah. or or you were given one as part of your academy or whatever yeah. it is and so I think like random spell selection and random spell assignment, at least for first level characters, to to force players out of their habits, to to get them to start thinking about spells in a different way, to get them going out and looking for the spells they really want to cast. That's the big one, right? Like random spell selection comes up in older versions of D and D when there's just one type of Ma- you know, magic. There is the magic user, and that encompasses wizards and warlocks and sorcerers and all kinds of, of archetypes. And you get one offensive spell, one defensive spell, one utility spell from randomly chosen from a list in the DMG. Your DM will give them to you. And the rest, if you want the good spells, you've got to go out and get them. Mm-hmm. You've got to find them. You've got to take them from enemies, uh, wizards, and you've got to like find scrolls of them. Yeah. And kind of see the same thing here, where it's like. First off, an underwhelming spell that doesn't get cast a lot, you can create a scenario where it will that spell will be very valuable and now they mm-hmm. may maybe have to go find it because yeah. they've never bothered to learn it. Yeah, you got to get out in the world and find Becky with the good spells. Right, exactly. <laughs> uh, and so like, I would think about that. I, I encourage you, like, just consider it. Random spell selection. I, my, my brother's currently playing a, uh, a wild, uh, you know, wild sorcerer in, uh, in a game I'm running for him. Some other people on, uh, over on Twitch. And it's like, he's decided and convinced me that like every time we play, he has a random selection of spells. Except for the ones his character has developed specifically for herself to like 
use and, and utilize, uh, all of uh, all of his sorcerer spells are random every time we play, and so like and I let him like I because of the nature of his character I was like you can use sorcerer or druid spells, you know you can like uh, put some from uh, the druid list on your on uh, on your sorcerer spell list and he just randomly rolls every time and it's we've had ones where he's had to deal with having a ray of sickness <laughs> as one of his spells and just figuring out oh it's not the worst and it's just it's fun to watch him like have to deal with and figure out, all right, how do I deal with this random assortment of powers that I have, at, at, you know, and I get the benefit of having a casters in the, in the party who's not like always picking the same stuff and like. Yeah, yeah, no, oh, definitely. Yeah, and, and honestly, like easily 50% of most of these shows where I'm like, this thing's happening and it's bullshit and you should change it is probably because I'm bored by how the samey it is and I'm gonna make all the rest of you have to suffer. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> because... although, although in an underwater campaign, Ray of Sickness could also double as a fog cloud. I mean, if they're, yeah. like, if they're like actually retching and vomiting. And retching and vomiting. It fills <laughs> the water up and now you have a, now you have like a vomit cloud and Right, obscuring uh, vision. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That'd be really good. Two well, for the price of one. It was actually really in the in the in the session in question, which uh, they had to make do with it. They they had to deal with a bunch of giant sort of psychic um, uh, ortho or um, you know, like sea scorpions, uh, arthropods or something, and they would like come up and were pulling sailors off the ship and dragging them down with these like long sucker tentacles. And so those who could breathe underwater jumped in to save them. And it's like, yeah, you want like being able to poison something at range while while it's grappling something is a really useful ability but mm -hmm. you wouldn't know it if you never take a spell like ray of sickness you know mm -hmm. you'd take something else so anyway that's just a personal uh, personal anecdote and yeah randomize your spell selection try it out do something fun yeah do something different if you like the video give it a thumbs up and subscribe web dm exists thanks to our patreon patrons the web demons if you join the web demons you'll get our weekly podcast show audio discounts that'll save you way more than five dollars a month on books and dice and so much more check out our free podcast episodes right now including our interview with dale kingsmill of monarchs factory youtube channel webdm is a proud partner of DD beyond our favorite supplement for our DD games we've got a link to them in the description go and check them out if you like our advice for your games then why don't you come check us out and watch us play yeah we've got games on twitch every week and they're archived on our second YouTube channel, WebDM Plays. Thanks for watching. Well, you can cut around that, right? Yeah, yeah, I mean, there's a lot there, but okay, good. Holy fuck. Holy shit. Like halfway through that episode, I touched the back of my knee, oh. and it was just like water. It's like, no.